So uh, for this second uh, session, uh, I shall be introducing some basic terms in, that we use in business and finance and accounting, of course. Uh, and then I, for every example, for every term or every phrase that I shall discuss with you, uh, I shall be trying my best to get the examples uh, in the context of BP. And if I'm able to get that example in the context of BP, I'm sure you will be able to get in your case company as well. Okay. So let's start with the basic thing, transaction. Transaction is the core. Unless there's a transaction, there's no revenue, no cost, no expenses. So when you sell something to your buyer, it is a transaction. Transaction is that somebody buys the product from you and you get the cash. When you hire the labor, it's a transaction. You pay the wage and in turn, the laborer is giving you his labor. When you are renting an apartment, you are taking the apartment's services. You know, that's a service that you live there. You have four walls to live in. You have a roof to feel secure. But in turn, you pay them rent. You're hungry, you buy food. You buy food, you pay money. Transaction. So the entire economic setup is, a, is based on transactions. Am I sounding very philosophical? A little bit. I showed you some time ago the income statement of BP. And there was a first sentence, the first line was revenue. Revenue was what? BP sold oil, let's say, to the buyers. Buyers took oil and they pay money, cash to BP. Transaction. BP is paying uh, interest. Do you know, you saw the BP was paying interest. Well, BP is paying interest because BP borrowed money. That's a transaction. So all the entire economic system or the business system is based on transactions. Transactions could be on credit or, or it could be on cash. Do you get my point? You can buy something on credit or you can buy for cash. Uh, why can't I make it to display here? Yeah. When you pay some cash, you buy something, but cash is not the only thing you pay. You can buy something on credit also. It depends upon the nature of business, I think. If you are buying something from a store, grocery, uh, normally you pay cash and then you, okay. But if you are a company like BP and you're selling um, barrels and gallons of, you know, all the oil, uh, then you will not get them. There's no till point where you pay the cash to BP. It has to be a massive amount of money and the time gap could be huge. It can be for many years sometimes. And that is the credit transaction. So the transaction could be a cash transaction or it could be a credit transaction. And it is about the goods and services. You can buy a goods, you can buy a service. You buy this marker, you pay cash, it's a good. Okay. But when you are paying fee for the admission of university and you get education, that's a service. Goods are physical. Services are non-physical or intangible, but they're very useful. One day, I give you a task. Try to find out the composition of GDP of the major economies in the world. I can safely bet that the highest percentage will be of service sector. If you look at all the OECD countries, 
I think 50% or more on an average GDP come from the tertiary sector. Then comes the industrial sector, and then comes the uh, primary sector, which includes agriculture and all the nature-based activities. So the services are so crucial. Profit, we discussed profit, revenue, cash, gain. I think I will not come to that. Balance sheet. Balance sheet shows the assets and liabilities. The balance sheet shows what business own and what business owe. And for this, I would give you an example, but I want you to see it first for, for, a, for a, maybe a minute or so. Have a look at this. After one minute, I would show you an example in the context of BP about the balance sheet here. Because any point you want to discuss with me, have you got some idea from this? What is balance sheet? What is asset? What is liability? Balance sheet is a statement showing assets and liability. It's good that I give you an example. Look at this. It's a balance sheet. You have total assets. Do you see that? How many assets you have here? Can somebody speak? 276. 51. Five, I'm, I'm taking total assets, the whole uh, block, 515. Five. It means that BP is worth nearly uh, $277 billion. But on the other side, if you look at the liabilities, uh, the total liabilities are 176. And if you look at the difference, the difference between this and this, I would write in red. That is equal to 100, 404, so that the both sides are equal. Now, in the context of BP, we shall study assets and liabilities. This statement is called balance sheet. This whole statement is called balance sheet. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so insensitive. Uh, but that was not that was not intentional. Hmm? Okay. Um, have you ever asked yourself what type of balance sheet you have in your life? Can, can you can you talk about the balance sheet in your life's context? Very often, I move away from finance and I go to philosophy. Hmm? Life what we own, what we owe, what we got, what we lost. So we make this kind of statement in our life also. Good things, bad things, lean patches, good times. And then we make a balance sheet of life, like a check. Cross, ah, bad thing, tick, good thing. And see whether life has been successful so far or not so successful. 
The same thing is balance sheet. Uh, this side is what business own. And this side is what business owe. As long as what you own is more than what you owe, this figure is positive. If this red figure called capital or equity, yeah, total equity, if this figure is positive, if assets are more than or equal to liabilities, it shows that the company is solvent, company exists. Imagine this figure is bigger than this figure. This is big, this is small. This would be negative. If the company's equity is negative, it means all the money invested by shareholder is a junk, is gone basically <laughs> and when the shareholders lose all the value negative value means you have lost value basically if this is the case the company ceases to exist and then the proceeding starts how to declare the company bankrupt how to take the money away how to dismantle how to close down it basically so this is like a very cruel fact that in case your equity, which in this case was uh, over $100 billion, it's a surplus. It shows that the company is saving, is, is alive. If this 100 becomes small, next year 80, 60, 70, 40, even though the company is alive, we have the reason to be worried. It's like an inching towards death. And if this becomes zero or negative, BP would no longer exist. Okay. So as long as what you owe own is more than what you owe, the company have a right to exist. The company is solvent. But if what you owe is more than what you own, then that number becomes negative company is dead. Look at the history of all the dead companies. Look at WorldCom, look at Enron, look at uh, Lehman Brothers, look at um, Adelphia. If you look at the history of all these companies, you will find that their equity or capital became negative. Shareholders lost everything. Okay? It doesn't matter then which kind of shareholders you are, preference or ordinary. No, you lose value. There you go. The company ceases to exist. It's the reality. Feeling so emotional, so sad. It's like a death. It's like like demise. It's like a, the company is no longer existing. Since I'm recording and before I start crying, I should change the slide. Uh, so this is the whole idea that as long as assets are more than liabilities, uh, the company exists. If it doesn't, then the company is dead. I stop using this word. Uh, profit and loss, we have discussed already, right? I, I showed you the income statement thoroughly, so I will not go into that. Uh, assets, now we only focus on assets. Assets could be of two types. Well, they can be of many types. But broadly speaking, the assets could be uh, current, non-current, fixed, Tangible, intangible. Can you see different names here? You can see tangible, intangible, uh, current, non-current. Okay. Please remember these words. Tangible, intangible, current, non-current. Do we see them in the actual example? Yeah, they are, right? They should be here. Can you see them? The current assets, the non-current assets the tangible and intangible. Well, anything which is other than intangible specifically written are tangibles. 
assets are and one more thing i think i i discussed with you last time this side is financing sometimes we confuse with the word finance and investment the the other side the liability plus capital side is where the money comes from hence financing this asset side is where the money goes to means investments okay so if the, your investment performance is great then you will not only be able to earn money but you, uh, well you, then you will not only be able to pay back the money who you owe to but you will also be able to generate surplus for the company which you can use for reinvestment research and development and further development product development brand development uh, taking your company from finland to rest of the world and so on and so forth so if your this side performance is superseding this side liabilities then you're doing great so if imagine your return on assets is 10% but you are paying 6% to your investors wow you are saving 4% and this 4% on many many billions can be many many millions and this money is acting as a buffer for you as a surplus for you which you can use for the company's future growth and development if you look at the legacy of the companies there are many companies which are over 100 year old and even more why they are able to exist such a why they are so sustainable because their asset side have constantly overperformed their liability side so if they are able to get money from their investors at 6% then they were able to generate return on assets more than 6% okay so this shows their operational efficiency coming back to assets uh just the way i use these phrases in my slides i can see you all these phrases in the reality also the company have two basically two categories of assets the current assets and the non current assets the current assets broadly speaking are those which will realize their value in within a year i hope you remember in finance in accounting the short period or the current period is up to 364 days anything under one year is current and anything 365 days and above is non current so it means that if you look at this bottom block current assets these are the assets which will mature within a year right but if you look at the top um, block you see the non current assets which would mature uh, beyond one year look at that current asset loan well loan you also give companies also when the company gives a loan it's an investment isn't it? so investment is asset but look look at the word loan is here and here also well this loan is given for let's say 3 months 6 months 9 months maybe this loan is given for 20 years okay so the same thing become current asset and non current asset so if you are giving a loan to a company let's say bp has given loan to uh, chevron for 3 months 6 months then it would appear here up to 364 days but if bp has given loan to another company or even deposited in the bank so basically bp has given loan to the bank but the the deposit is the account is for 5 years then this is this loan and becomes non current account okay so same thing could be current and non current assets yes sir are those numbers for uh, the positive interest they gain from the loans or just the, the total amount no 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 this is the this is the total amount they give not the interest the total deposit yeah. loan not the interest look it makes sense because otherwise it would be look if it's an interest then it should be in the income statement 
because see what imagine i buy a building and give on rent okay building is my asset which will be shown in the balance sheet but the interest which i sorry the rent which i get will be in the income statement my revenue okay so you can see here and then there are some other category i discussed with you tangible assets and intangible assets tangible assets are those which are physical seeable touchable existing you can see with your naked eye intangibles are which are very important very strategic but you can't see them now here if you see in case of bp there is a category of called intangible assets can you see that intangible assets and i don't know uh, it's purely incidental there's no current intangible assets it means they all are for long time can i ask you what could be intangible asset for a oil company i can imagine for microsoft that the software they develop is an intangible asset i can develop i can i can understand for glaxo smith klein they develop some drugs and they have some those formulas it's an intangible asset but what about bp it's a oil it's a old fashioned oil company yes sir okay they the technology could be a uh, you know the in house the r and d if they develop some technique which nobody else has okay it's an asset uh it can also be the license you get my point bp is in the oil sector the oil sector is highly regulated sector you have to take so many you can't just start oil business straight away the license the permissions which they have which others don't have is is also an intangible asset okay but i like your example the technology which bp has developed so that they have less wastage they have faster drilling uh, that can be intangible asset for sure yeah did i ignore anybody who raised hand or something yeah. okay rest all are uh, tangible assets okay um hmm. have a look at them this and this side uh look this is the finalization total assets but on top of that please go through it and i really want to see how do you observe something here and do you think that there is something confusing you and you want to ask me if you don't ask me then I, of course i will ask you which one is better arrangement hmm? property plant equipment is it tangible or intangible tangible is it uh, current or non current why is it non current because property plan equipment stays for many many years it will not collapse in 6 months hopefully not will it collapse in case of gulf of mexico once but that's a different story so there is property plan equipment here yeah i'm coming to this do you know what is goodwill what is goodwill what is goodwill mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm the goodwill is uh first of all goodwill is also a type of intangible asset because you can't see it uh in many ways it's a very important point through which you can manipulate data because basically you can create any type of goodwill or any amount of goodwill the goodwill is that let's say i have a property plan equipment let's say i have a plot of land i can calculate how many meters land i have i can multiply find the cost of it and then i can find how much how many stories i have and then i can find a cost 
size of my building. But then I find, hey, is the same building in Kiskusta is valuable as in Keltinamaki? Same hundred square meters, same two stories. Are they equally valuable? Why not? When the area is same, when tangibility is same, same number of room, color, paint, everything, size, design, shape, all same. Why the same building is comparatively less valuable in a little bit away from the city and is more valuable in city center? Why so? Location, access to serve facilities. So if you are a seller of this building, then on top of size of the building, size of the land, you're adding some more premium to it. Hey, uh, train station is closed, one additional, some, so you add some money to the value. Uh, all the facilities, all the entertainment, everything is there. You don't have to have a car. Uh, Yamke is so close, you can just walk down. So when you're adding all these qualitative numbers, qualitative values, to the quantitative, which exists tangible, that is called goodwill. It's a premium you're demanding. If you're, you're basically telling somebody that, hey, if you want to buy my building, the size of the land, the brick, the stone, the wood, everything, everything added makes 120,000 euros, but I will not take anything less than 150,000 from you because this extra 30,000 is because you are close to the airport or train station or the city center or the extra facilities or the store is closed nearby, school is closed, whatever. This is called goodwill. Right? Because there is no real tangibility, so there is some element of absurdity while you are putting a value of goodwill. And this is where the auditors are very careful, the lawmakers are very careful how much value you call as a goodwill. So, because that's, it's like a matter of, for example, if I'm a seller of the house and you are the buyer of the house, I say, hey, the base price is 120,000 of this house, but I will not accept anything 150,000 because of these, 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 these facilities. You may argue, no, I think, I accept that this place is good, location is good, but I think 30,000 premium is too much. I think 20,000 is. So there is always an element of absurdity or some kind of subjectivity. So therefore, wherever there is subjectivity, the law maker would be very careful in checking your claims. Basically, the goodwill is a claim you make. How authentic, authenticated, how reliable, how trustworthy this uh, claim is, it depends upon how the lawmaker check you. Is it really worth making a claim this much? Or it's an inflated figure. Uh, Felix, you have something to ask? Normally for, uh, properties. The, uh, yeah, normally for the properties, yeah. Right. Because um, when I was working in the government, they have a lot of different types of property that you can buy and Mm -hmm. uh, which like shows the price or the, the goodwill mm -hmm. uh, in average in every location around yeah. the city. So was kind of like the yeah. tangible? Yeah, because you could still see like basically on paper on the average. Yeah, on papers, yes. Yeah. This is also on papers. Yeah, but if you say you can just like say, yeah, I think it's very It's estimated, but the, my point is that I'm not saying it's a fluke. I'm not saying you can say anything. Yeah. What I'm saying is that even on papers, your estimated could be too optimist. But somebody else's who is checking you, his estimate could be very pessimistic. So both have some figures to show. So there is some calculation by both parties. But one is could be overestimated or exaggerated. The other could be more moderate or a little bit pessimistic. So both are calculations. This is why even though we in accounting and finance, we deal with the numbers, but the behavioral aspect, the psychological phenomena, how euphoric or how pessimistic you are can play a role. 
and sometimes you are optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. When it comes to assets, you sound very optimistic, but when it comes to liabilities, you want to be pessimistic, right? So that's very opportunism, um, you know, in, in case of, uh, you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Well, if it's on lease, then you pay rent basically, yeah. It depends on um, who you buy from. If you are buying from the company directly, then until you pay your last mortgage, the, the building basically belongs to. So you're only paying a kind of uh, property rights to live in, but your property is yours only when uh, you pay the last installment. But if you get your property through the bank, then you own the property right from the beginning, but then you owe the money to the bank. Yes. They take on lease. Yes. Will go, will go down. Sometimes they think uh, they could sell the lease mm -hmm. or they give the opportunity yeah. to another company mm -hmm. but still maintain the lease. That it then can't go on asset. Uh, no, uh, this will never be an asset because BP itself took it uh, on lease. So it's not a property of. Normally, you don't buy seas, you don't buy oceans, you only take on lease. But you can you can sell your license to somebody else. That that you can take sell on premium basically, or you ask the other company, hey, you go and stand in the queue then. Come after after five years. I'm I'm giving you my I'm selling my license right now, but then pay me premium. Like for example, when you sublet your house, sublet your apartment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, near. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both ways, both ways. Sometimes they raise it just for the sake of it. <laughs> but if there are some good things happening about the company, then they also start appreciating the goodwill. Yeah, it stays, yeah. So if you, for example, want to see what exactly is consisting of goodwill or how they calculate it, then you can uh, dig it deeper in note 12. Uh, investments in joint ventures is for long time, of course, investment in associates, investment, and some other investments. Uh, I think I we discussed last time that um, your least cooperation with the outside company could be in the form of associates. Then comes the joint ventures. I think joint venture is nearly 50 50, but if it is more than 50 60 percent, then it's called subsidiary. Fixed assets. Uh, within the, if you look at that, it's very interesting. So if you see that your overall category is non current assets, but within the non current assets, they make a fixed asset here. Fixed assets, which remain comparatively fixed. And then come some other assets like loan. Uh, what is this? Trade and other receivables. Does somebody know who they are? Remember, they are assets. Trade and other receivables. Hmm? Trade and other receivable. And why are they assets? Trade and other receivables. I'll tell you something. BP sells something today. The buyer say, I would pay you after one year. Mm -hmm. So BP is selling on credit. BP is selling oil on credit. Those people who bought from BP, but yet to pay, yet to pay, are 
trade and other receivables. Does it make sense? After all, they are your assets. You own them, don't you? They owe to you. They owe to you, it means you own them. But not as a person, but on the claims. Does it make sense? If somebody takes money from you, hey, can you give me uh, five euros today? I'll, I'll pay you two days later. Isn't what they owe to you? They owe to you and you own them to the extent of five euros. So it's an asset. For them, it's a liability. Okay. And why are why are they in non-current assets? Because they agreed that they will pay you after a year. Are you with me? So these are the people, people who would pay you back after more than a year. But see what? The same thing is here also. Because these are the buyers who promise that they would pay you under one year. So if somebody is taking something from you on credit and would pay you after a year comes here. But if somebody buys from you and ask, hey, I will pay you in three months, six months, but definitely under one year comes here. Okay. I will not explain on purpose derivatives, financial instruments yet, because we will do our second assignment, which you will be doing is actually this thing. So I'll explain it later. Uh, prepayments. Prepayments are assets. Prepayments are assets. What is this? Prepayments are assets in the non-current and the prepayments are also assets in the current. What is that and why is asset? What is a prepayment? If somebody asks you, uh, it's a prepayment, what does it mean basically? Yes. Uh, you, pay first. Uh, after you, pay, you, get you paid something in, in advance, yeah. basically. It's advance payment. When you pay somebody advance, is it? do you think that it's your asset or liability? Hmm? Why is it asset? Sorry? Yeah, so it's an asset for you because you took a claim. Let's say you are going for your exchange studies, yeah? And you want to buy an apartment, not buy, but <laughs> rent an apartment in the, in the open area, uh, not in the open area. Uh, I mean to say that in the open market, okay? So you see the advertisement, okay, this is Amsterdam and I want to be there, okay, fine. You negotiate with the, with the landlord. And the landlord says, you know what, you are coming in September, but I would take rent till November. So pay me September, October, November's rent in advance. Right? When you pay it and you uh, land in Amsterdam, you'll be more confident because you know that for the next three months, you have a claim over the thing. Right? Because you prepaid it. So psychologically, it's an asset for you. Okay? If you made a prepayment for less than a year, let's say you paid rent for three months, six months, it's a prepayment here. But if you have prepaid, which you will be actually getting the benefit after one year, and the same prepayment is here in the non-current assets. So the current and non-current is just a rule of thumb. 364 days, 365 and above. The same thing can happen in the short period or the long period. So basically the current period is short period and the non-current period is long period. Does it make sense? So the same things could be both. Deferred tax assets. Look at the word. Deferred tax assets. What does it mean? Huh? Deferred tax assets. It's like a tax voucher or a tax credit given to you by the state, which says that, hey, uh, don't pay me tax for next two, three years. So basically, it's like an asset. You think that, hey, I'm relieved now. Look, when you have to see assets and liability, it's also a matter of your expression. 
State says, don't pay me tax for next three years. What a relief. I have a, I have a claim over state not to pay them tax. If tomorrow somebody comes to me and asks, hey, you haven't paid me tax, I would show him this voucher. Look, I have the permission not to pay tax for next two years. I have some special tax concession. Let's say I'm a Finnish company making lots of investment in, in Estonia. And because of my too much of investment spending, state of Finland asked me, okay, fine, good. I'm very happy. You're making investments abroad. You're opening a new hotels in Tallinn and elsewhere. We agree that you, we, because you're already spending a lot of money. Yeah. Good job. Don't pay me tax for next five years. We will recalculate after five years. It's an asset to me. It's an asset to me. And here, because this is in which category? Non-current. It means that I have the permission, the BP has the permission not to pay taxes on certain matters beyond a year because it's in the non-current assets category. So it's an asset. And likewise, there are many other uh, you know, aspects. So, and believe me, if you can, uh, not two companies would have the same structure of assets. So they, that would change. But the, I, what I'm trying to discuss with you is that it's very important to understand the sp spirit behind the assets and liabilities, okay? So these are the assets, intangible, trademarks, copyrights. So then we go to the next. Uh, current assets, um, I have discussed with you. Uh, normally the current assets are cash, cash equivalents, inventory, accounts receivable. So these are prepaid or the prepayment, yeah? So we have done basically all these things. But one thing I want to ask you, what is the difference between cash and cash equivalents? Think what could be cash and cash equivalents? Do they have cash equivalents? Not necessarily, but of course, um, oh yes, they have cash and cash equivalents. I didn't know that. Cash, remember the word cash and cash equivalents. Alan, you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Cash, the hard cash. Uh, do, do they keep in the company office? Do, do they have a place where they have some kind of den? Uh, there's a button they press and then it opens and then you go down in the cellar. Hmm? No, no, I was, I was just kidding. I was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alan, come on. I have a very bad sense of humor, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I nearly agree with you. Uh, cash is basically not the cash you stash in your office basement uh, or in your pillows. Well, the bank notes are also cash, which you have in your wallet, yeah? But the bank deposit, which you have, is also cash, by the way, okay? Uh, nobody keeps cash nowadays. I mean, we, I was, uh, just some time ago, I was talking to Steve and he was telling me, Shab, it's been ages since I saw any bank note in my wallet. And I showed that I have some coins. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that cash is the cash, which is normally in the bank accounts. Yeah? But the important thing which Alan said is cash equivalents. Cash equivalent is what you can easily convert in cash with no loss immediately. Can you give me something, some example of cash equivalents, which you can convert very easily in cash? Gold. Yeah, shares could be cash equivalents. Yeah, uh, huh? Shares, checks. Well, that's a bank. Check is a bank account. <laughs> that that could be also equivalent. But the problem is that who will accept it? So that that is also a problem because not everybody would like to cash equivalent. Look at the definition of cash equivalent. The cash equivalent is that people don't have any fear, hesitation in accepting them because they are as good as cash. Bonds, uh, I would say bill, bills and bonds. 
The bills are for short period, which means that short means the current means under a year. If you have, okay, yeah, I got a good example of cash equivalents. You know, the uh, state treasury bills is a cash equivalent because they are issued by the state. Notes are also issued by the state basically. But on notes, you don't have the interest, but on bills, you bear the, you have the interest. But there is a market where you can just go and sell it. Okay. And the state would accept it because state is the one who issued it, by the way. Why won't they accept it? Okay. So I think the treasury bills, the T bills, which the state is issuing, uh, is also a good example of cash equivalents because they are nearly equal to cash. People who you give, well, you don't give it, you, you can't give the cash equivalents at the tail point. You have to give cash on the card. Uh, but in some transactions, you can say that, hey, you know what? I owe you 120 euros. Take 100 euros cash. Take 20 euro bill. Uh, it is, look, there's a guarantee. It's issued by the uh, Suomi Panki, the Bank of Finland. And it is, it, its maturity is after three months. So you can go and get the cash. Hopefully somebody accepts it. But they're very close to cash, right? Um, and then we discuss the non-current assets. It's, uh, then comes liabilities. The liabilities are what you own or what? What you owe, what you owe to others. And liabilities can also be current, non-current. Basically, it's good that you see them so that you decide by yourself. So after we have total assets, let's go to total, uh, no, not here, a little bit up. Um, I can move myself a little bit away. So you have the current liabilities and the non-current liabilities. Somebody tell me very quickly, what is the, what is the difference between current and non-current liabilities in theory? beyond a year. Very good. So the current liabilities is that what you owe, but you must discharge, you must pay back your liability under a year. But the non-current is that which can go for many, many years to come. And the rule, the, the line of distinction is 364 days. Up to 364 days is current. 365 and above is non-current. Yeah. So you have the trade and other payables. Wait a sec. Payables. Did you see a word called trade receivables? What was that trade receivables? Hmm? What are receivables? Yes, Felix. Yeah. Uh, the trade receivables are those that I'm BP, I'm selling you oil, you buy from me. Uh, one of you say, Shab will pay you in six months. The other say, I'll pay you in six years. You both are my trade receivables. You're my assets because I owe claim on you. But what if myself, the company, is buying something from my suppliers? And I make a claim that, hey, can you give me this inputs or machine or whatever? But you know what? I'll pay you in six months. Then I'm a, then I, it's a liability on me. In my own eyes, I owe you, right? So in that case, I would call myself that I owe, I owe nearly $45 billion under a year. So BP owes to others less than a year, approximately $44 billion. But BP owes to, does BP owes for more than a year to anybody? Any payable? Well, that's a different thing. But in the non-current assets, can you see the same thing here also? No. So basically BP, and these are mainly suppliers. Receivables are mainly your customers who are yet to pay you. 
and payables are your supplier who you are yet to pay. So it's a supply chain. Can you see that? You have the raw material from suppliers, you process, and then you sell. People don't pay you yet receivables, but you haven't paid yet to your own suppliers, payables. Receivables, payables. Okay. Um, I will not touch derivatives yet. Accruals. 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 Look, these new words coming, and this this is this this is the best time to learn them. Accruals. Look, accruals are also in the non-current assets as well. It means, but remember, they both are liabilities. Accrual is accruals are what? Accrual comes from the word accrued, which basically means due, which basically means due. Um, you are going to Amsterdam for your exchange, let alone making a prepayment. You haven't even paid your September's rent. While you were signing the lease, while in 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 Uvascula with your landlord, the landlord was saying, "Hey, I'm not in a rush to uh, the the property belongs to you. Of course, you can come in September, no problem. Um, you can make me payment in October, for example." So basically, it means that you paid for September month without paying the rent. Is it your asset or liability? Is it an asset or liability to you? I'm trying to make it as non-financial as possible. Is it an asset for you or a liability for you? Sorry? Remember the previous example? Uh, you want to go to Amsterdam for exchange and the landlord say, hey, you have to pay me three months in advance. Only then I would let you enter the property. But this time you're saying that the landlord is saying that, you know what, uh, you come in September, but unfortunately I will not be in, in Amsterdam then. Uh, do one thing, you pay me in October. So you, the keys are there, just come collect, start living there in September, but pay me in October. So pay me the October rent and as well as the September rent, basically. You know. huh? It's a liability. Because you are, even though you're living there in September, but you in October, you don't, you not only have to pay October rent, but also the September rent. So it's like a, it's like a psychologically, there's a pressure that, Hey, I have to pay. Yeah. Get my point. This is a liability that's called accrual. Accrual is the payment is due, but not paid yet. Accrual means the payment is due. It should be made. But because of some reasons, you haven't paid it yet. That is called accrual. If your accruals are under a year, then they are in the current assets, ah, current liabilities. But if they will be paid after a year, then they can be non-current. But anyways, they are your liabilities. Yeah. Imagine you are an entrepreneur and somebody's working for you, you haven't paid the salary of the month. You say that, you know what? Sorry, your salary is due, but I don't have money. Can, can I pay you next week? Is it okay? All right, okay. Well, it's a liability. But if you have paid advanced salary to your employee, then it's your asset because then he owes you, not you. So it depends upon who owes who. Uh, accruals, the debt, the finance debt. Hmm? Uh, a word of caution in many books you will see just debt or finance debt or interest bearing debt you know uh, debt what is debt debt is good stuff <laughs> it's very good yeah it's only bad when you pay hmm? as long as you don't pay it it's good 
Hmm? What is finance debt? If this is finance debt, then why are they not finance debt? Why are the other items not finance debt? Okay, I gave you two examples. You owe 100 euros to the bank. Situation A. Situation B, you owe 100 euros rent to your landlord. Situation C, you owe 100 euros to your supplier who provides you inputs. Which one is finance debt? Which one is not finance debt? And why not? You owe 100 euros to the bank because you have to pay. You haven't paid yet. You owe 100 euros to your landlord. You haven't paid rent yet. You owe 100 euros to your supplier. He gave you some inputs and you use them, but you haven't paid him. Which one? Yes. Uh, a finance, B actual, and C Very good. Very good. So the A is finance debt because you borrow money per se. As such, visibly you got money. You need to pay it back. In the second case, it's a rent due. So it's your what? Accrual. But you didn't, you didn't deal in it financial transaction. That was not, it was an arrangement. It was not a financial transaction. And in third case, it's your uh, payables. Yeah, very rightly used words, payables. So it's like a finance debt, accruals, and payables. Thank you so much for very, uh, very befitting phrase you used. Okay, so the money which you owe to your supplier is not a finance debt. You haven't paid rent. It's not a finance liability. But the money which you borrow from, money means you took money from somebody. You have to give it back. That's a finance debt. The money which you owe to your supplier is an operational liability because you operate in your factory. You have the inputs, you, you churn out output. It's an operational liability. It's not a financial liability. So we need to be very categorical, very clear that which liability fits where. Deferred tax liabilities. Deferred tax liabilities. What is that? And there is a some tax here also, current tax payable, deferred tax liability. What does it mean? The current tax payable is that you owe to the tax man, the current tax. You haven't paid it yet. It's due, but not paid. It's like an accrual, yeah? Tax is due, but not paid. But this tax is for this period, means less than a year. But then, for the last four or five years, maybe you have been suffering from losses. You have not paid tax to the tax man, but tax is due. You will be paying tax at some stage. Remember, state normally never forgive your tax. It only postpones. Okay, don't you can't pay me this year, pay me next year. But it doesn't forgive you. <laughs> So when it gives you, okay, fine, pay me after th three years, it's a deferred tax liability. It is a liability, but it's only a deferred. Deferred means, if I use the simple English, it's delayed. It's a delay. You will pay in delay, by delay, yeah, whatever. By delaying it. It's a late payment but eventually you have to pay it. Uh, yeah, something like that. I'm missing out something. Hmm? Okay, we'll come to this again. So these are different types of uh, liabilities, if I can say so.
And then comes your internal liability. Before I go to internal liability, may I ask you, can you see the internal liability and external liability here? Because there is a reason I flip the chart. Hmm? The word is liability, so it, it must be on the other side. Internal liability and external liability. May I do the role play again? I take you back to the last week. I'm a company. I want to start this company. I need money. I need financing. Half of you give me your shares. You invest in shares. It means that if I get profits, you will get more money back. But if I am having a loss, you will lose your money, perhaps. And half of you said, no, 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 we, um, we want to play safe. You take money from us, but on the promise that you will not only give the principal money back, but also give us interest. So half of you are my debt holders and half of you are my equity holders. Who is my external supplier and who is my internal supplier of money? Sorry? Equity. So the people who invest in equity, they are the owners of the company. They are, when, they, when you invest in my equity stocks, when you buy equity from me, you know what it means? It means that you are making a promise with, to me, hey, Shab, you know what? In every thick and thin, we are with you. We'll be beneficiary if you succeed, but we are ready to lose our money if you fail. It means that people who invest in equity are representing internal capital. They are part of the game. They're part of the company. But for them, it was a very formal, uh, we use a phrase in English, arm's length distance. They are, they're external, they're outside. Because they said, you know what, we help you, but we want to keep a distance from you. Take money from us, use it, but give us our interest and money back. But you guys took more risk. So you took the risk even to the extent that you can lose everything you invested in my company. So they people are external liability and these are internal liability. It means that this liability per se, the word liability per se is external liability. And the equity word, total equity, is the internal capital. If you want to see it, I can show you again, even though I showed you before. Uh, if you go back to the balance sheet. Oh, yeah, it's here. Can somebody uh, identify the external liability? and the internal liability for BP. Mm -hmm. Can you identify the external liability and the, and the internal liability? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say again. Which, which one say again? No, 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 no. Uh, that's one small example. I'm talking in the bigger picture now. Did you, did you hear my example I gave? And I want to start the company. Half of you become debt holders. Half of you become equity holders. Okay, I took overall, okay. I took overall one euro from you. Yeah. All my debt holders make one euro. All my equity holders, I took one euro from you. So what I get, I get one euro from them, the external. I took one euro from you guys, the internal, and my assets are two euros. Okay. 
I think I showed you the picture here. Can you see 176111 here? Is it here also? What is 176111? Total, Total liabilities, exactly. Total liabilities are your external capital. And what is 10404? What is the word written there? Total equity. Total equity, they invested in shares. And if you add 176 triple one, 100404, that will be equal to total assets. So basically, I took one from you, one from you, put together two. Okay, so total liabilities are your basically external capital. They are the people who are from outside. And the internal capital is which belongs to the shareholders. Shareholders are the owners of the company. They are the owners of the company, not you people. Because I owe you, I give you interest and your main money back. But they are the owners. Does it make sense or not? Um, so the share capital uh, or the undistributed profits are the internal capital. The working capital is uh, working capital. You know what is, have you heard working capital word before or not? Have you heard working capital? This word before. The working capital is required to finance or to fund your day to day businesses, the daily businesses, your operational things. And your working capital is equal to the uh, your working capital, the formula is equal to total as total current assets minus current liabilities. So the current assets minus current liabilities is your working capital. Make sense? Look, you are solvent. You are solvent when your total assets are more than your total liabilities. But you are liquid when your current assets are more than your current liabilities. Liquid means you have good working capital. Uh, Working capital means you have enough money to finance your uh, routine expenditures. Imagine your current liabilities are more than your current assets. It means that you owe people more than what you can get. What will happen to your firm then? Imagine for the next six months, you owe people 700 euros. But what people owe to you in turn is only 400 euros. Is it a good situation or bad situation? Why it's bad? Come on. It's only for three months. What's wrong with this? What's wrong? Huh? You will not have working capital. You don't, how would you work? You have money, but all the money goes to pay back the short term liabilities. How would you work then? How would you pay your wages? How would you buy raw material then? Okay, so your operations will come to halt uh, if your working capital is not enough. You can have a very great non-current assets, but they will mature after 10 years. Come on, you're, you're bothering about 10 years. You have to pay wages tomorrow. So that is why timing is very important. So you must have enough uh, positive working capital. Okay, and the formula of working capital is your current assets minus current liabilities should be positive. If it is not, it's a, uh, you know, in this case, it's very important uh, that who is the controller of the company, right? I think I shared one example with you that uh, if you have a negative working capital, it means that you don't have enough cash to finance your daily operations. 
Do you remember last week I gave you an example that in London's stock exchange, on an average, 1% companies become bankrupt. And 75, 80% of these companies who get bankrupt, they have huge profits. And the reason they become bankrupt is that they don't have enough cash. And why don't they have enough cash? Because their current liabilities are more than their current assets. So even though it's a crisis of working capital, but it can push the company towards insolvency. If a company is having a negative working capital consistently, it can push to it to a full-fledged uh, insolvency crisis. Okay, do one thing. Uh, this is BP. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. <clears throat> can you find out working capital of BP? Yeah, you have current assets. Uh, what you can't see is current liabilities. Yeah. No, you can actually. You have current assets and you have current liabilities here. Yeah, I think you can. So, do you think that it's a working capital is good for the uh, forget about forget about BP installation? Do they have enough cash on daily basis to work? Do they have enough pay, money to pay the bills? <laughs> yes. Uh, the current assets are. Uh, 276,000 something, is it? Oh, no, 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 74, yeah? 74 billion, and how much uh, current liability they have? Six, well, I would say they're living, they're living slightly dangerously. <laughs> There's not much, as a rule of thumb, I tell you something, as a rule of thumb, as you are reckoned as a safe company and you will not have any operational daily problems, everything will be coming and all payments will be, your supplier will be very happy with you. If your current assets exceed your current liabilities by two times, two is to one. Two is to one is a very textbook rule of thumb parameter, okay? Uh, whereas in this case, it, it's not two is to one, I think. It's a less margin, yeah? Uh, the two is to one rule doesn't hold here. Mm -hmm. But then I'm in defense of BP. I would say that this two is to one rule may not be very good for BP. If it is Prisma or Walmart or Tesco, and this is their figure of current assets and current liabilities, I have a very, very big reason to be worried. I have to call an emergency meeting of uh, all the company's top officials and discuss the matter. But maybe in case of BP, I would, I would keep an eye. I will not take it off the radar, but I will not be so, um, so much panicked. Why so? The figure is same. If it is not BP, let's call it Walmart. I would be seriously worried. Why so? The reason I'll be worried about Walmart is that the company by nature is cash based. Everything you buy on the till point, you pay cash and then you leave. There's no real credit basically. Are you with me? Despite that, despite that, the current assets are not just by, by a small margin, they're exceeding the liabilities. Okay. For BP, I can give a leeway because it's not a cash based company. I would say for a company like BP, the retail business is not even more than 
right, from the gas station where you pay the cash. Apart from that, uh, all the mega transactions, which is between B2B, are on credit. So therefore, uh, I will not be so much panicked in case of BP, but I'm still a little bit worried. The margin uh, is not huge. It should be a little bit more. If not two is to one, at least 1.5. <laughs> yes. This same period when they were making loss in 2015, what was the work capital margin? Uh, in 2015, um, can I see 2015 data? Unfortunately, yeah, this is 2000. That's a problem. Yeah, the income statement they show for three years, but the balance sheet they only show for two years. This is, or maybe they're too ashamed of showing it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, normally, the balance sheet is for two years, but the income statement is for three years. So, but of course, you can go to the company's archives and check it, right? Okay. Um, so the current assets and the current liabilities are very important in life. In life, it's very important that you can have your balance sheet. But in life, it's also very important that you have a short-term balance sheet. What you have gained or what you have lost in the recent past is very important. So it's very important to have a uh, positive total equity in your life. And also it's important that you have a positive working capital in life. Hmm? You get my point? No? Okay. Think about it. <laughs> yes, you want to ask me something. Uh -huh. What about uh my non-current liabilities are yeah. more than my uh, non-current uh, assets. Well, the, the thing is that, yeah, I, I tell you something. I tell you something. When it comes to payments, liabilities, the time is very important. If, the, if, your, if your liabilities are short term, it's always a pain in the neck. But if there are more liabilities, but they are due, more liabilities are non-current, at least you're buying time. You have more time to arrange yourself, to rearrange yourself, okay? For example, if I owe 1 million tomorrow and 1 million after two years, the both are my liabilities, right? But the one I owe tomorrow is more pressing than the one I owe after one year. If you want, I can give you an example. In 1997, Southeast Asia, India was not a very good performing country then in terms of economic miracles. It, it came up much later, but I'm talking about 1997. Well, India was doing fine because there was a new IT revolution at that time and things were getting better, but not so good, not so good. And then there were very strong Asian economies, uh, including Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, uh, Taiwan, yeah? The great economies doing wonders. We used to call, well, we still call them as Asian tigers. And suddenly in June, July of, uh, no, it was August actually, August 97, these Asian miracle economy were almost fell apart. Almost fell apart. Whereas a very uh, elephant walk country like India, too big, too slow, survived. And this was a lot of discussion afterwards that how come these technology based very fast, so posh economies nearly collapsed and India didn't. Even though India's uh, economic infrastructure was hardly anything to praise at that time. The reason was that India owed huge amount of money to the outside world, but almost 90% of that liability was non-current liability. Whereas Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, they owed less amount of money 
in comparison to India, but most of their liabilities were current liabilities. They were due soon. And then suddenly, because the payment pressure became so big that these countries nearly collapsed. There was a full-fledged economic collapsation. The banks in these countries were completely in disaster. Thanks to George Soros. I'm giving you a hint. Explore. This is a very important example. Do it by yourself. Okay, because the lecture is getting recorded, I will not say more about it. I don't want to be killed by spies. Uh, oh, okay, I'm still recording it. Okay, okay uh, thank you so much for your presence and your, 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 your action-packed presence. Uh, I, shall, uh, I shall upload this link on YouTube and share the link with you, yeah? See you next week. Uh, have fun. Thank you.